Dr. Trouth, you have spoken so often and with such passion about how special the Whitliff is to you. And we wanted to give you a small token to show you uh, how special you are to us. Yeah. Wow. Now you can't see me. So I'm sure you are overrun with bobcats. <laughs> bobcats probably haunt your dreams. Uh, but this one has a very special resonance to all of us at the Whitliff. Uh, uh, Caroscuro Woodcut by one of our very favorite artists, David Everett, who is here in the audience with us today. <laughs> We're honored to show so many of David's works in, uh, on our walls, in our signage, et cetera. It's an honor for us to have him be so much part of our collections. And today we're honored to be able to give it to you, Dr. Trout. Thank you. Come on out. <laughs> so, please welcome Dr. Denise Trout. Thank you. Thank you, David both for your remarks and for that wonderful gift. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here today with all of you, certainly one of the biggest crowds we've had at the Whitliff. Um, and on behalf of Texas State University, it, it really is my honor to kick off this celebration of, of just a wonderful literary anthology. Uh, this new book is incredibly significant for our university community because of everything that it represents. You don't have to look far to see how important the San Marcos River is to the daily life of Texas State University, to our research enterprise, to the creative expression that thrives among our students, faculty, and staff, um, from recreation uh, to water quality research to the stewardship of this precious resource. Um, the river is foundational to Texas State University. And we're just so fortunate to have the San Marcos River winding through this campus. Uh, and it's not only an iconic symbol of this town and of Texas State, we know that it, it is the most important resource we have, and many, many of us draw inspiration from it. Um, Texas State has a, a distinguished and unusual record of protecting and restoring the San Marcos River that dates back to the 1990s when the university acquired uh, what was previously the Ocarina Springs theme park with the famous swimming pig. <laughs> and we, that was a beloved tourist attraction, um, and I've, I've heard that from many, many people. Um, but we transformed it into a research center of excellence, um, particularly under Andy's stewardship. Um, and it's a site for preservation efforts that will serve generations of Texans for many, many years to come. The Meadows Center for Water and the Environment has had a significant impact on critical water issues throughout the state of Texas, not just here in San Marcos. And our work in water research, in leadership, education, stewardship begins with Spring Lake. Uh, and that is, of course, one of the largest springs in the world. Uh, and it ripples out from San Marcos across Texas. And, and of course, we also hear from many of our students that the river was the thing that enticed them to come to Texas State University. Uh, and all you have to do on a, on a nice day is drive by Sewell Park uh, when it's sunny and, and you can barely see the grass beneath all the, the sunbathers uh, who are there on the riverbanks. We call that the study hall. <laughs> but getting to know, love, and appreciate the river really is an important part of being in the Bobcat family. Um, glass bottom boat tours at the Meadow Center are uh, a favorite activity of every new employee orientation session that we do. And that's true also for our freshman orientation sessions. They all get on a glass bottom boat. Um, 
So today we're here though to celebrate Viva Texas Rivers. Uh, it's a natural fit that a literary work such as this would be born from the Texas state community, um, featuring the state's leading writers, many of whom are present today, and we're just so pleased to have you here. And we are pleased to be associated with these outstanding writers and indebted to them for sharing their talents in this book. They've helped others learn more and more about why these waterways are so vital to Texas and so deserving of our protection. The book is truly groundbreaking. It's, it's the first time that the state's most prominent literary voices have come together to share a unified voice on such an important topic. Both the Meadows Center and the Whitliffe Collections have a distinguished record of publishing award-winning books in their respective book series. The Meadows Center has published over 30 titles in its River book series, and the Whitliffe Collections has also published over 30 titles in its literary series. But Viva Texas Rivers represents the unique partnership. For the first time, these two groups, the Whitliffe and the Meadows Center, came together to publish this book, and now it's part of both of those series. It's a tremendous privilege for Texas State to be home to the Whitliffe Collections, where we really reveal the beauty and the mystery and power of Texas, of Mexico, and the Southwest. Um, the Whitliffe now includes more than 500 special collections in literature, music, photography, and film. And the works that we have here in the Whitliffe Collections remind us of the majesty of Texas and how fortunate we are to live in this place and call it our home. And I'd be remiss today if I didn't recognize Sally Whitliffe. Sally and Bill's vision made all of this possible. So th Sally, thank you so much for all you've done. <laughs> And now I'd like to turn the program over to Steve Davis. I think you all know he's the longtime literary curator of the Whitliffe Collections. He's also, though, the author and editor of eight books. His works have made the best of lists both of Amazon and National Public Radio. Steve has numerous awards to his name, including the Penn Center Literary Award for Research Nonfiction and the Writers League of Texas Award for Best Nonfiction. He has also been a finalist for top nonfiction prizes from the Texas Institute of Letters and the Philosophical Society of Texas. He's the past president of the Texas Institute of Letters, this is a literary honor society with an elected membership consisted, consisting of the state's most respected writers. His many contributions to the Whitliffe Collections have really helped the Whitliffe become the crown jewel of Texas State University. So please, let's welcome Steve Davis. Thanks so much, everybody. And President Trout, again, thank you for your leadership of this university for all these years. We've been so proud to have you as our president. And um, it was great to hear you mention the incoming freshmen are doing glass bottom, glass bottom boat rides, and they picked Texas State in part because of the San Marcos River. That's so different than when I came here in the 1980s. Um, like a lot of people, I had no idea what the San Marcos River was. You know, I'd grown up in suburbs of Dallas and Houston, land of swimming pools and canned amusement park rides. And, and in Dallas, the Trinity River, all, I knew of the Trinity were the news reports that talked about fish kills and dead bodies. <laughs> and then in Houston, I was honestly terrified of the bayous. Um, I was certain they were toxic waste dumps where marauding and possibly mutant alligators prowled. <laughs> So when I came to school here and I saw people shucking off their clothes and jumping in this river, my thought was, what the hell is wrong with you people? So, um, you know, th th things are different now and it's good to see. Um, and I did, you know, I did eventually visit Ocarina Springs as a student. Um, and even, you know, th there, the clear, gorgeous water was really a stage prop because the main attractions were the swimming pig, 
the mermaids who guzzled soda pop underwater. Um, there, yeah, there was the fake Old West town with the fake gunfights. And the saddest thing really uh, were the little ducks that were stuffed into these kind of glorified bubble gum machines. And they, there was a hot plate on the bottom of that. And if you put a quarter in, um, it activated the hot plate so the ducks would perform a dance for you. Which, and you know, this was the level of entertainment that we had at one of the most precious natural shrines on the North American continent. So I say, I'm damn glad Texas State took over Ocarina Springs. Thank you to this university. Thank you to Andy Sanson and the Meadow Center for what you've done there. It's just been so nice to see that transformation. You know, things have, things have changed over the years, and we are. We're seeing an evolution happen right before our eyes now when it comes to Texas rivers, not just what Texas State has done here in San Marcos, but also we've seen Buffalo Bayou revitalized in Houston. We've seen the San Antonio River restored to something approaching its former glory as it flows out of downtown. There's even a move afoot to resurrect Comanche Springs in Fort Stockton. And it is uh, the Meadows Center that leads a lot of the scientific research and the policy solutions that drive these positive changes. And so there has been a lot of good change. Uh, the issues affecting Texas rivers are hardly settled, as we all know. And so as we gather here today, less than a mile from the headwaters of the San Marcos River, we should acknowledge the First Nations that began living along these same waters many, many thousands of years ago. They viewed the rivers as holy places to be revered, and we can better honor their legacy and safeguard our own future by continuing to learn how to become better stewards of the water and the land. And I want to say uh, when Sam Feaster and I began putting this book together, we found to our delight that many of the state's most talented writers had developed their own sense of fascination and even reverence for a particular Texas river. They have researched and they have explored and they have meditated alongside the flowing waters. They have listened to what the rivers are saying. They have become witnesses to places where life begins and can sometimes end. They have channeled all of their love and their thinking into luminous personal essays and sparkling flashes of poetry. And some of the most meaningful words these writers have ever committed to paper are about the rivers that speak to them and through them to us. And Sam and I are so proud to have assembled this all-star collection of Texas literary talent. And we are very fortunate that many of these writers have been able to join us here today for this celebration. Thank you all. We're going to be signing your, your books today, too. So we have book sales around the corner. This is, of course, a historic occasion to, to get a real keepsake um, for yourself or for five or six friends. Um, and then I'd like to, to say just a, a few words about Sam Feaster. Uh, I could not have asked for a better co-editor for this book. Sam is more than a treasured friend. He is a true Renaissance Texan. He is a dynamic entrepreneur a civic-minded leader and community builder, and the author of four very fine novels, including an astoundingly good book based on his personal experiences in Vietnam. And in his spare time on the side, Sam also created the hit 2018 indie film set in West Texas, Blanche. <laughs> and highly significant to this book is the fact that Sam is an expert riverman. He began as a boy floating his homemade raft through the canyons of the Big Bend before any commercial trips were offered. Since those days, Sam has canoed more than 100 rivers around the world. He has paddled among the piranhas on the Amazon. He's fished for Siberian trout in the Mongolian outback. And he's come to know every bend in every major river in the western US. I'm the kind of guy who's dipped my toe into a few rivers. Sam is the real deal, a full-fledged, River Radis Americanus. <laughs> that is Sam. Several years ago, uh, Sam stepped forward and volunteered his support for the Whitliffe collections. And as both Bill and Sally have observed, 
it was a damn good day for this place when Sam Feaster walked in the door. He is the longtime chair of our Whitliff Advisory Council, and he's become a leading force in helping the Whitliff achieve the vision that Bill and Sally laid out years ago. And so David Coleman and I were talking a few weeks ago about all that Sam has done for us, and we thought, you know, this is the good a time as any to honor Sam, to salute Sam, to thank him for all he's done for the Whitliff. So Sam, on behalf of the Whitliff and all of us who support the Whitliff, thank you very much. And what says we love you better than a framed David Everett woodcut print? <laughs> the horned toad. I, I speak truth. I speak truth. Um, so, and I, I want to say a quick word about our program. Um, as you know, our writers and our artists, Clemente Guzman, uh, will all be here to sign your books at the end. In just a few minutes, you're going to see a short video, about 10 minutes long, that features many of the writers who are in the book. And we are also going to have a conversation this afternoon between the noted river experts, Andy Sansom and Joe Nick Potosky. Joe Nick is, of course, a celebrated journalist and an award-winning author who's published acclaimed books on many subjects. He has written on dozens of Texas rivers, and Texas Highways Magazine recently described Joe Nick as the king of Texas rivers, which we don't disagree with at all. And if you've had a chance to see our exhibition on Viva Texas Rivers, you may have noticed uh, a pair of Joe Nick's historic swimming trunks on display <laughs> there. Thank you again for those, Joe Nick. Um, Andrew Sansom is quite simply our spirit guide for Viva Texas Rivers. He is a leading Texas conservationist, a legendary protector of Texas rivers. He has overseen the publication, as you've heard, of more than 30 books on Texas rivers from the Meadows Center, where he was the founding director. And when you if you've seen the cover of the book, that is Andy on the cover paddling the Meadow Center canoe. So we'll get to our video and our conversation with Joe Nick and Andy in just a couple of moments. First, we have a very special treat for you all. We did not have time for every author to read today, so we've chosen one symbolically who will read for all of us. And Sam and I knew that getting into this book that there was one literary piece that would perfectly kick off this collection. It was written by the beloved, internationally heralded poet laureate of San Antonio, poet laureate of Texas, a remarkably talented author who is a singular force in Texas letters. This writer did more than contribute to our book. She was offered us so much wise counsel and guidance along the way. And she really became the madrina, the godmother of this book, Viva Texas Rivers. And so ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you Carmen Tafoya. Represent all the writers. You didn't tell me that when you asked me to come do this. That, that's, a, that's a tall order because there are people in this audience that just one of them would be enough to blow us all away uh, with their talent. But all of y'all, I'll do the best I can. First, I do want to thank Steve and Sam for putting together this amazing, beautiful volume. Um, many of us have love and passion for a river or many of the rivers of this area. Uh, the, the poem that starts the book, um, it's called This River Here. I thought when I wrote it that it was about the San Antonio River because my great-grandmother washed the family's laundry in the San Antonio River under, in that time period when all the flags kept changing, you know, you'd look up and like it was like, oh, this is the Republic of Mexico. Oh no, it's the Republic of Texas. Oh, wait a minute, it's the United States? It's the Confederacy, it's the United States. Okay, um, and she, um, uh, she, she, they, she washed the clothes in the San Antonio River, close to where the Hilton is now. Um, so I thought it was about her, but then 
I also realized that my grandfather had done a lot of his baptisms in the Medina River. So maybe it was really kind of a blend of the San Antonio and the Medina. And then I remembered that my great grandfather had served in the Second Cavalry, passing, crossing, feeding his, uh, watering his horses uh, at all of the rivers of, of Texas, and that we had had uh, people on both sides of the Rio Grande uh, for many, many generations finding uh, the river significant. So I think that rivers become a metaphor for all of us of our human experience because they flow, they move, they change, they all meet up, they all become part of the same body of water. They all flow together eventually. Um, so it's not just about San Antonio. It's, it's about all of us. This river here. This river here is full of me and mine. This river here is full of you and yours. Right here, or maybe a little farther down, my great-grandmother washed the dirt out of her family's clothes, soaking them, scrubbing them, bringing them up clean. Right here, or maybe a little farther down, my grandpa washed the sins out of his congregation's souls, baptizing them, scrubbing them, bringing them up clean. Right here. Or maybe a little farther down, my great-great-grandma froze with fear as she glimpsed between the lean, dark trees a lean, dark Indian peering at her. She ran home screaming, Ay, los indios, ay vienen los indios, the Indians are coming, as he threw pebbles at her, laughing. Till one day she got mad and stayed and threw pebbles right back at him. After they got married, they <laughs> built their house right here, or maybe a little farther down. Right here, my father gathered mesquite beans and wild berries, working with a passion during the Depression. His eager sweat poured off and mixed so easily with the water of this river here. Right here, my mother cried in silence so far from her home, sitting with her one brown suitcase, a travel trunk packed full with blessings and rolling tears of loneliness and longing, which mixed again so easily with the currents of this river here. Right here, we'd pour out picnics and childhood's blood from dirty scrapes on dirty knees and every generation's first-hand stories of the weeping lady, La Llorona, <laughs> haunting the river every night, crying, ay, mis hijos. It happened right here. The fear dripped off our skin and the blood dripped off our scrapes and they mixed with the river water right here, right here. The stories and the stillness of those gone before us haunt us still, now grown, our scrapes in different places. The voices of those now dead, quieter, but not too far away. Right here, we were married, you and I, and the music filled the air, danced in, <laughs> dipped in, mixed in with the river water, dirt, Sins, fear, anger, sweat, tears, love, music, blood, and memories. It was right here. And right here we stand, washing clean our memories, baptizing our hearts, gathering past and present, dancing to the flow we find right here. Or maybe a little farther down. <laughs> Hey y'all, how you doing? Hello. It is so nice. Right here. <laughs> it is so nice to be in a room full of river people and not lake people. <laughs> and there is a difference. And if you don't know the difference, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, it's a joy and an honor to be here today uh, just to celebrate rivers and to uh, celebrate it with all these great writers. But really, to get to celebrate it with this guy over here who's been one of my guiding compasses ever since I got the idea that there's, there was more to a river in Texas than the Trinity River, which I grew up on. 
and it was a muddy river. And it really took, for me, a trip as a kid to Ocarina Springs, Yale, Ralph the Diving Pig, and uh, Glurpo the Clown. We even spent quarters in the IQ Zoo, Steve. But it was that water. I'd never seen water like that before. And then when I moved down this way, when my wife introduces me to Barton Springs and tells me it's really not that cold, and, uh, <laughs> and it took a while to do a, a width and then finally a length, and then I had to swim every day. I would get cranky if I didn't. And then to discover all the great bodies of water around this state, and particularly in the hill country, uh, this has been a gift. I, you know, I, think, I like to think rivers here are special, but I would like to ask the expert here Again, he's been my guiding compass going back to Texas Parks and Wildlife and teaching me things about open spaces and how we keep wide open spaces wide open. Uh, buy that land. Buy something like Big Ben Ranch. That's an accomplishment. that uh, You can rest on those laurels alone, Andy. <laughs> but I'm real curious that I don't want to go start from the backwards, but you have the afterword in this book. You get the last word on the state of Texas rivers. And... Uh, I'm not asking you to give it all away, but how are our rivers doing? What is the state of Texas rivers? Well, thank you for those kind words, Joe Nick. I have a lot of people fooled. But, um, you know, let me say first that it's an honor for the Meadows Center to be here and be a part of this project. It's an unbelievable honor to be among these writers who I've gobbled up their words for so many years, and some of them I'm meeting for the first time, and it's, it's a wonderful experience this afternoon. We're very, very grateful to be part of this project. So I grew up on, along with Carol Ch Fleck Chapman, on Oyster Creek, which was a, also one of those turbid, muddy streams. And I came to the Ocarina Springs as a child almost every summer and learned how beautiful a resource like that could be. But you know, I've been here on the campus uh, starting in Fe Fe this February. I've been here 20 years, which Joe Nick is as long as I've ever been able to hold a job. <laughs> <laughs> and um, there's a couple of things that I've learned here. One, this, the springs in San Marcos are a globally significant resource. They're the second largest artesian springs in the West, one of the largest springs in the world. They're home to eight federally listed endangered or threatened species. And they are clearly one of the oldest, if not the oldest continuously inhabited site by human beings in North America. And for 20 years, I've walked into my office every morning, which used to be in the honeymoon suite, and, um, and pinch myself at the good fortune I have to look out into that water every day. But I've also learned since I've been here that we're going to have twice as many people in Texas in the next 50 years to find water for. And yet we have already given permission for more water to be withdrawn from most of our major rivers than is actually in them. But that means that we've been granting water rights since we were a colony of Spain as if the rivers of Texas were infinite. And if all of those water rights were actually exercised, many of our most important rivers would be dry today. And yet we have to find water for twice as many people. So if you, if you have children or grandchildren and they want to know what they should do when they grow up, tell them to be water lawyers because they're going to be very successful and provide very, very important work for the rest of us. So this idea of the Meadows Institute, I don't think this exists anywhere else. It created an institute dedicated to the study of rivers. That's, that's a new idea, or that was a new idea. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity that my colleagues and I at the Meadows Center, the current uh, director, Robert, ba Robert Mace, uh, have here on the campus, and it's because of the leadership of the university that's allowed us to, to do what we love and we, what we think is, is really important. I'm not sure that there's any institution like it anywhere in the world. There's certainly no university anywhere in the world 
that has a resource like this spring in the middle of its campus. And that alone causes it to be one of the most significant water institutions that there is. You know, during your tenure at uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife, it was always kind of, it became, I became aware of the idea of, of data, information. I mean, you're dealing with politicians and policies, but you can't argue with data. And you seem to really be aggressive about collecting data on everything that was related to the natural environment. Well, the frontier, I believe, is in groundwater because the, most of the water that flows down our rivers and streams in Texas comes from our aquifers, all of which are very different. And I will tell you that the person that knows more hydrogeologically about the aquifers in Texas is Dr. Robert Mace at the Meadows Center. And so one of the things that we should be immensely proud of is that we do produce the most significant data relative to our water resources that, that exist in any university. So with that knowledge, uh, can we put that to use? I mean, there are success stories like Buffalo Bayou getting cleaned up. I mean, rivers can be remediated. I, I know on my, I, I'm writing about the Brazos for Texas Highways magazine right now, and boy, that river has gotten beat up every which way. I mean, humans have been trying to manipulate it and run it all kinds of ways, but I'm seeing in certain parts of it that you can restore it to before humans got there and tried to exploit it. There are some pretty inspiring things going on, and they largely relate not to necessarily to the data produced at places like the Meadow Center, but by the passion of volunteers and communities along our rivers throughout the state. I, I can't imagine a better example of that than, than in the community of Wimberley, where they have been so concerned about the Cypress Creek that flows through the city that they're actually building an elementary school that has zero discharge with a one water system in order to protect Cypress Blue, Creek. Blue Hole Elementary. So it's, it's critical that we, that we understand that there are people throughout this audience who devoted a huge part of their lives to protecting the rivers in their community. And it would not, would not happen without that kind of dedication and passion. And that's probably the most important thing about riding a glass bottom boat, is that I, I've had teachers tell me, I can tell my kids all day long about springs but when they can look down through that glass bottom and see it actually coming out of the ground, then there's an epiphany of understanding which they can get no other way. So I think most of the people here have, have a, 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 some kind of feeling for rivers, a passion I'd like to think. But what do we do about it as individuals? I mean, yeah, we can write about it. Some of us have that ability. But what, what can we do as just individual citizens to help our rivers? Well, you know, when, when I, over the years, have appeared before various audiences and quoted these dire statistics, you know, people always ask me, well, I'm an accountant, I'm a teacher, I'm a college professor, you know, what can I do about this issue? About 30 years ago now, my colleagues and I at Parks and Wildlife took a group of African-American children from East Austin canoeing on the Lampasas. And these kids were all elementary to middle school. They'd never been on a river before. Probably many of them had never been out of East Austin. And when they got in the canoes, you thought they were on spaceships, you know, because they were so uncomfortable with this new uh, experience. But we had some great uh, volunteer leaders who taught these kids how to how to use a canoe and within a matter of an hour you'd have thought they'd been in canoes all their lives. And so we canoed down the land passes for about six hours and when we got to the sandbar where we were taking out to camp for the night one of the adult leaders was standing on the sandbar skipping rocks. And one of these children said did you see what that dude did? <laughs> and for the next two hours, we got out on the sandbar and taught these children to skip rocks. And that night, after dinner and the dishes were washed, the adult leaders, both black and white, were sitting around the campfire telling stories. 
and the children were back down on the sandbar in the pitch black dark, <laughs> skipping rocks. <laughs> what every one of us can do, no matter what we do for work or family, is we can find a way during the course of a year to introduce a child to the joy of being in the rivers and being in water. That it's fun, it's good for you, it's healthy, it's spiritually significant, but if it's going to be there for their children and grandchildren, then they're going to have to take responsibility for it. And every single one of us can take the time to put a child in a river sometime during the year. Uh, we've got time for a few questions before we run out and uh, have to wrap this thing up. Does anyone have any, anything you'd like to ask Andy? Yeah, is there alligators in the Colorado yet? <laughs> Are there alligators in the Colorado? Yeah, yeah. they're in the capital. They're pretty close. <laughs> Questions, anyone? All right, hold on for a second. We got a question here in the front. Sally? Okay. After a snow, I have a place on the San Marcos and below Louie. And after a storm, there are always trees and limbs and everything in the river. Should you just leave that and hope the river washes it down? Or what do you do about that? Well, you know, it, it depends on the situation um, it, 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 and how bad the flood was. I can tell you that one of my closest friends who's been involved in um, helping protect Cypress Creek in the Blanco owns a piece of property between here and Wimberley on the Blanco that received an immense amount of flood damage and trees after the huge flood we experienced. And he told me that he spent several months on heavy equipment clearing all of that stuff along the river. And his greatest fear was that he would find a child in one of those brush piles. But yet at the same time, today, it's being restored because of that cleanup. And uh, so, so typically, um, y y you know, it, it, it just depends on how severe it is. Well, it, the San Marcos will get out of its banks. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and Wimberley, our, our Property Owners Association called Ryan McGillicuddy of Texas Parks and Wildlife. He's a, he's a river biologist. And he came and kind of analyzed the situation. We had some good riparian habitat. He was he kind of t told us, don't mow at all. If you mow on a slope, you leave a little on the top so you don't have runoff. He, he did a lot of good strategies, but the good news was he's basically saying don't do anything. The, and, and the more we did nothing, the better the restoration's been, I think. M much of the most important habitat, particularly in western rivers, results from deadfall trees that are in the river that provide pools, particularly for things like rainbow trout. So it can often be an ecological benefit. <laughs> well, the Guadalupe does. The Guadalupe does. <laughs> the largest uh, chapter of Trout Unlimited in the United States is between here and San Antonio because of the, the trout on the quad. Which are, have, are surviving year-round. Yeah. They don't have to uh, stock them anymore necessarily. Questions? i got time for one or two more real quick. Or we're just going to move on because we've got a lot of celebrating to do today. All right, Andy. Joan, you thank you. Favorite? Can you tell us what each of you your favorite is? You know, I asked Andy this earlier. He said that's like asking the, the former director of Texas Parks and Wildlife, "What's your favorite state park?" Which would get me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> my favorite is my the river I live closest to, and that's the Blanco, and that's always my concern and my obsession, and where I got to swim today. But it's get it's dicey right now. Andy, what can you do about rain? <laughs> Well, one, one of the things that Nona and I say when people come to visit us, and I learned it from a college professor at Texas Tech, is when they leave, we say, you're as welcome as the rain. Well, you're as welcome as the rain with me anytime. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.